thank you very much for joining us today for our session in augmented fashion with a wonderful team from Robert Gordon University and from and with Caroline um, Adams from Interface. I will introduce each of our panelists in a second, but um, first of all, to uh, give you a bit of an overview of the session. So um, I'm Joan Johnson from Expo North Digital, and we help support creative industries in the Highlands and Islands um, and the Murray region around the digital aspect um, within the creative sector. Uh, today, we're going to be um, hearing about an exciting project uh, around um, augmented fashion and um, a real life uh, project and uh, the benefits of um, the digital technology that's been used in this. So although it's got a fashion lead, it's really appropriate for lots of different product areas and I'm certainly really keen to see this as we move forward in this digital age, we need to be using more of this technology to communicate with customers, um, both far and wide. And um, the work certainly that's been done here will um, help give an idea of what the potential is. So first of all, I would like to introduce our panelists. So today we have Karen Cross, who's the Academic Strategic Lead at um, Rob Gordon University. We've also got um, Josie Steed, who is Senior Lecturer in Design from Grace um, School of Art at Robert Gordon University. We also have Dr. Yang um, Chung, who's Senior Lecturer in Digital Technology. And perhaps if you'd like to all um, switch on your cameras, then um, the audience can see you, uh, which is great. Yeah, here we go. Here's our team. Uh, in addition to that, we have Carol Ann Adams from Interface. Um, an interface is an organization which helps support connecting projects in industry with um, these academic research. And Caroline will um, speak a little bit at the, towards the end of the session about the work that interface have played within this project. So um, I'm not going to say very much more at this point. I will hand over to Karen, who will um, introduce the project and what they've been working on. And if you have any questions, I'd ask if you put that in the Q&A section, we will raise those um, towards the end uh, of, the, of the section. So over to Karen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joan. I will just share my screen now. Bear with me a second. Hopefully that's good for everyone. So hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today and welcome to this presentation on our augmented fashion project and its connected projects. My name, as Joan said, is Karen and I'm one of the project's co-investigators and I'm joined here today by my colleagues Yang and Josie and together we form an interdisciplinary research team spanning design, business and marketing and computing. So the Augmented Fashion Project aims to determine how immersive technologies such as augmented reality and virtual reality can be used to engage contemporary audiences, for example, our digital native Generation Z, with traditional fashion and textile products. So really to help them appreciate how they're made, what they're made from, where they come from, and why they perhaps cost more than cheap and disposable fast fashion products. The project remit involved UK-China collaboration, which has not been easy due to COVID, um, but it's interesting given that both countries have a, a rich textile heritage, but are very different in terms of scale of textile and fashion production and those consumer markets. So our initial research established that fashion brands were already using augmented and virtual technologies in three ways. Firstly, as you can see here on the slide, by creating virtual changing room try-on experiences um, through customizable avatars and things like body scanning and AR tracking. So you've got the app on the mobile phone there that can add trainers onto your feet via your mobile phone and give you that virtual try-on experience. Secondly, um, by showing product. So we've got things like virtual fashion shows, which were really accelerated during uh, COVID-19 lockdown. 
We've got the use of 3D modelling, which can reduce sampling costs and, and show realistic product before it's even made. And we've got gaming technologies. Um, so the image here was uh, a collaboration between Balenciaga and the gaming platform Fortnite. And you could buy virtual Balenciaga products within the game, but you could also buy real Balenciaga, Balenciaga products within the stores. Thirdly, we have fashion brands trying to really engage with our social lives or, or just engage with us for entertainment purposes. Um, the example that I have here is Burberry's augmented reality app, where you could download Burberry check frames. They had little scribbles and doodles by an artist called Danny Sangra. Um, and you could add that to your own content and then share it via your social media. So it spreads the brand without really trying to sell a brand product and gives us that really interesting mix of user generated and brand generated content. What we found then was a gap um, that there was little evidence of textile or fashion brands using immersive technologies to communicate craftsmanship or provenance. And for us, that suggested a missed opportunity in terms of using these immersive technologies to communicate culture and place and almost to rehumanize the making of clothing in the minds of these contemporary consumers who quite often aren't aware of how or where or who is making their clothes. We conducted an exploratory survey to compare consumer reaction to traditional video media and some virtual reality content that we had created as part of the project. The traditional video content was the Harris Tweed Hebrides story. Um, they are one of our project partners. And, and this is freely available on their website. It's aimed at both their business to business customers, but also as end consumers of traditional tweed product. Our survey participants were asked to watch this traditional video and then asked a series of questions related to Harris Tweed's brand image and identity. We then asked them to view a virtual reality experience that we commissioned as part of the project. They were asked the exact same set of brand image and identity questions um, after they'd watched this. And you can see um, just a still from it here. It's this kind of UK-China mashup that had elements of our cultural heritage and bits and pieces of fashion and textiles from both countries um, in this virtual world that you could kind of fly through and move around in. And I've just presented a couple of the key findings of that. So we asked participants, which words or phrases would you associate with the brand after viewing the content? Um, and you can see the difference here between watching the traditional video and they came up with words that we would really expect, such as heritage, quality, handmade, traditional. But viewing the immersive content, the identity for the brand is changed in the minds of the consumers. They see the brand as futuristic and modern. There's still elements of heritage and tradition in there, um, but it's more sort of fashion forward for them um, and trendier. Similarly, when we ask them um, what type of person they think the brand is trying to target, you can see that they come up very much with a, a wealthy, older, traditional, middle-aged, not my favourite word, um, consumer. Um, they described that consumer as having a good economic status, as being for an older clientele. Um, but if we look at after watching the immersive content, there are fewer themes that emerge within the responses, um, but it's much more about a younger, um, a more tech savvy. They identify Generation Z. They're using words more as fashionable and creative. So, again, we're getting quite a different response from um, our survey participants. For us, then, there's obviously more findings, but I've just I've just put a couple on the slides for you today. And I guess really as an example of how 
we as university researchers can be put to use in exploring customer wants, needs and reactions towards your brand and product. Um, another one of the key findings that emerged when we were doing this survey is that the use of virtual reality is still pretty niche. Um, a few of our respondents had used VR headsets, for example, and they did find our crazy virtual world that we'd created a little bit confusing. So for us, the next step in this research is to create a more accessible immersive experience and rerun the survey with that content. Um, and you can see the start of that here. Uh, so we're working with a digital company called Lateral North, and they are currently creating a virtual Harris Tweed tour that will provide an interactive but accessible experience for both current and future Harris Tweed customers. Um, so again, aiming to bring this iconic heritage brand to audiences in a contemporary way. We're using what we learn from building this experience that can be accessed via VR headsets or just via a normal web browser to then think about how we could translate that into smaller brands. Um, so one of our project partners is Kirstine Stewart on Orkney and another one is Neil Anel on Shetland. So we're going to make smaller immersive bubbles, we're calling them, um, and, and see where that takes us in terms of feasibility of time and cost for smaller brands and designer makers to adopt this type of tech. Some more of our outputs that we have utilised um, within the project were some workshops. Um, so you can see here we did a series of four workshops um, all online again because of COVID. Um, the first one inviting speakers from UK and China to explore how immersive technologies and digital technologies were being used. Uh, the second one designed specifically to bring together uh, SMEs in the creative industries that had been impacted by COVID-19. And at a time when there was so much uncertainty that our participating businesses were really kind of grateful of the chance to discuss how their businesses had been impacted and how digital and immersive technologies might help to future proof them a little from similar issues going forward. Our third one focused on sustainability. Uh, sustainability is a key focus for many brands and consumers. It's a focus for the augmented fashion project. And it's actually one of the key cross-cutting themes across Robert Gordon University at the moment as well. Um, so we invited some Scottish brands that were working in or with a focus on sustainability as well as a circular economy expert to participate in that workshop. And we finally had a workshop where we brought in some experts in the Chinese market to detail what the Chinese consumer is looking for. Um, it's such a vast marketplace. And for any Scottish business to gain even a tiny, tiny bit of exposure and a tiny bit of that market could be really lucrative. Um, we have produced short reports from each of those workshops. So those are available on our website. Um, and we also did some research on the data that we gathered during those. Um, so there is a publication pending for that that will come out in a book, Can Fashion Save the World? Um, probably not, but we certainly have work to do within that area. Um, the model is quite interesting, though, because it focuses on digital storytelling and how there is an element of being able to support brands, brands supporting brands, so sharing um their personal and business support amongst SMEs, sharing that collective experience and forming part of a digital collaborative community that I think is especially important in the context of Scotland um, because we, you know, many of our businesses are rural and dispersed and small. And also in, in the second circle, this idea of communicating with consumers also as a collaborative community and engendering through education and engagement that citizen ethos and encouraging that more sustainable purchase and moving people away from fast and disposable purchases. And really across the Scottish creative industries, that's what we're about. We're not about cheap mass production. We're all about um, 
slow, sustainable, small batch, limited edition, um, which is a really important way forward. Hopefully then that's given you a taste of what our research has focused on so far. It continues and we will be doing more work. Um, but the Augmented Fashion Project has led to further research funding and opportunities for us. Um, so I'll hand over to my colleague Josie now to go through um, the next few slides. Thanks, Karen. So yes, we we through the Augmented Fashion Project, we we've um, also had um, some associated projects, and one of those being with our one of our creative partners, Harris Tweed Hebrides, um, which um, developed into a two year knowledge transfer partnership, um, which is supported through Innovate UK and actually this one is is funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council and um, we identified as, as Karen mentioned I mean a, a core um, thread that runs through our projects are, are, are all related around the sustainability the sustainability of the industry the issues around fast fashion and um, Harris Tweed Hebrides has um some core sustainability credentials, but I think they wanted to really work on making that much more explicit um, to their customers, but also to look at opportunities to develop their, um, their sustainability credentials in other ways too. Um, so we took the opportunity to develop um, a range of um uh themes around sustainability and the, the 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 knowledge transfer partnership enables the appointment of i suppose essentially a project manager um which is called the ktp associate um and in this case um it was a woven textile graduate uh who had studied at at um, heriot watt um and had had a few years of experience of working um, in in uh, the, the industry, actually at Johnson's of Elgin, um, who was appointed um, for that two year um, period, and one of the the outcomes of that has been that um, she has been now made a, a, a permanent member of the the Harris Tweed Hebrides staff, and and the development of a new role for their business is the design, sustainability, and quality officer, and I think this really just emphasises. The, the importance of, of that, that um, initial project has really driven the, the business's um, development in this area. Also, in terms of um, the, the company, um, Beth Wilson, who was the, the uh, associate, was instrumental in supporting and helping Harris Street Hebrides to, to gain um, the architect's um, standard 100, which is a, a sought after um, internationally um, recognized textile certification, which also I think in, in addition to the certifications around uh, the Harris Tweed industry already um, further um, demonstrates their um, their their products um, sustainability credentials. And through the project, um, the the company was able to develop a new range of um, of, of um, fabrics, uh, a naturals collection. So using undyed wool to reduce um, chemical use um, through dyeing, um, and this this has been a really successful um, project. Further to that, um, the the company has managed to invest in CAD digital design software. So by employing a recent graduate who had um, experience and knowledge of working with digital software has really helped the company to, um, to develop that. And they're the first of the um, Harris Tweed Mills to do that. Um, in terms of sustainability, it's it's it certainly helps to reduce the amount of waste created through sampling, and also it's it's very much helped them to speed up their customer request as well. Um, in addition to um, Beth now being appointed a, a permanent job, she's also um, now one of our associate lecturers. So this helps us to continue our collaboration with the company and also to provide the business with continued access to the resources of the university, such as 
um, accessing library resources. And also we have a number of um, subscriptions, for example, to WGSN, um, which for education. So it means that um, the company still has that opportunity to do that. And through the project, we have developed a number of student projects, both at Grey School of Art and also um, at um, Creative and Cultural Business School. So um, we're, we're hoping to continue that. We can move on to the next slide. Thank you. So a key finding has been from, from the KTP was that um, Beth um, identified that there was a research gap around the impact of dye stuffs on the compostability of wool. And um, we liaised with the School of Engineering at RGU and have successfully secured another grant application, a grant um, through um, AKT Act 21, which is, is um, a four month project to investigate and add to the company's sustainability knowledge in relation to the, um, the, the, the dye stuffs and the compostability of the wool. Um, this has generated a further um, research opportunity for a, a three additional uh, KTP associates um, from the School of Engineering, um, and we're um, we're excited that there's going to be a number of publication opportunities here that that from the findings of the of the work, which was, will address the identified knowledge gap, which will also not just inform the Harris Tweed industry, but will also help to um, inform the, um, the wool industry as well, both in the UK and internationally. In addition to that, um, currently, Karen uh, Yang and myself, we, we represent three schools within the university and, and, uh, and that has now widened through our um, bringing in uh, the School of Engineering to the project as well. So we really are working um, in, a, in a very truly um, interdisciplinary way. Um, I think what's very important for Harris Tweed Hebrides is to make authentic, authentic sustainability claims, as well as planning for how they deal with their waste products. And this project is, is very much um, going to help them with that. Next slide, please. So as, as I mentioned, um, we have, um, through our collaboration with Harris Tweed Hebrides, um, in both the augmented fashion and the knowledge transfer partnership, um, we've has been um, we've been able to develop a number of um, student projects, and this is really important for us so that students can gain direct um, information about industry. Um, in this case, the textile industry, and Harris Tweed Hebrides um, have uh, a. A lot of dead stock fabric, which could be the end of orders. It could be that um, there's flaws in it, flaws in the fabric. But it was really to identify opportunities for our students where they could utilize and, I suppose, create creative designs using um, what could potentially be an obsolete um, fabric. Um, and so our Grey's Fashion and Textile students used um, the dead stock fabric to create contemporary garment designs. And, and this was a fantastic opportunity for our students to work and understand more about the high quality fabric that's produced, not just from the Harris Tweed, but just generally in Scotland, and to also rethink and rework um, the fabric um, within an iconic brand. And I think, again, this shows how brands can become more involved with um, universities for, for, for mutual benefit to both, where, you know, expanding the reach and knowledge of their brand onto the next generation of the workforce and making them much more aware of, of the textile industry in Scotland. Next slide, please. So, and it's just worth mentioning here that... Um, Many of our project outputs so far have also been ex given exposure in China. So in 2022, we took part through one of our Chinese partners in Mode Shanghai Fashion Week, 
Um, and so some of the student garments that Josie just talked about went out there. Our virtual world that John Walter had created was out there on the VR headsets. We had some of our scans being shown on the screens. We had some posters up there. Um, and over that five-day event, there were several thousand visitors each day. So it really does show how a, a joint international project such as this can give that increased exposure to um, for Scottish brands in other marketplaces, which um, is great. Um, I'm going to hand back to Josie now to go through how beyond fashion itself, we've uh, moved into other areas with the Immersive Scotland project. Thanks, Karen. So, yeah, another connected project that has developed, um, I think, particularly um, during during COVID um, and, and through the um, augmented fashion project was has been the Immersive Scotland networking grant um, where it, we we were um, put in touch with a, a number of um, other academics and technology companies across Scotland doing really interesting work in, in the immersive space, particularly within the creative industries. And it became clear that there wasn't an, a, um, it wasn't very joined up and that was, a, was, was very difficult um, to access information about projects. And so there was an opportunity here um, for us to, to get together an immersive tech community across Scotland um, and, and help to, to bring together researchers from different universities um, across different companies um, and organisations, both cultural, historical and creative. Um, and we were successful in securing um, a, a grant from the Royal Society of Edinburgh um, in order to run a number of workshops, which we've been doing over the last two years. Um, the project um, took, started in, in lockdown, so uh, we've run a number of online workshops, which is, I think, really helped for uh, those researching into immersive technologies to share their work um, more broadly. Um, and we've also um, managed to run um, one in-person workshop at the Dovecot Studios in Edinburgh, um, where we were able to bring practitioners together. Each of our workshops has been in collaboration with um, a different um, university. So we wanted to ensure that there was, um, that we were capturing across Scotland, um, the range of different projects. So we've worked with UHI, we've worked with the University of Edinburgh, we've worked with Abate and Dundee University, um, to name a few. And we're currently just about to head up to Orkney and Shetland, um, where we're going to be bringing um, immersive technologies in some public facing events. So sort of really hands on events um, for anybody to come along um, to attend um, in the middle of April on the between the 18th and 21st of April. And these workshops will be free. Um, for anybody to attend and there's no experience uh, required so if anybody is interested in those um, please do get in touch um, if, you, if you're if you're up in Orkney and Shetland um, so that's that's um, very much an, a, an associated project and I think it's it's much broader in the sense that it's the creative industries as a whole not just within the fashion and textiles uh, area so we're looking at three-dimensional design um and bringing in um digital computing as well um and the creative computing side too which um i'll forward on now to i think is it to yang yeah over to you yang to um go through some of our interface voucher work yeah, thank you very much, Josie. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, so this is another associated project uh, uh, connected to the augmented fashion. Um, especially during the COVID, so there is an increased demandings from the uh, industries, so particularly sort of creative industries, uh, looking into the upscalings and digitizations of the uh, archives and the collections. 
So in many Highland museums, such as the Highland Museum of Childhood and the Granton Museum, and there are rich sort of costume collections for visitor try on experience and heritage exhibitions. And the COVID restricted the opportunities for this type of interactions, so physically by human being, but it's actually bursted or I mean increased the uh, demands in the digital uh, interactions instead. And then, so this is uh, um, uh, increased uh, sort of demandings uh, from the digital possibilities uh, for the close uh, artifacts, uh, etc. And these interface uh, virtual projects, uh, they are enabling the support uh, for the museums to transform their approach to the digital collection engagement and inspire new methods of uh, interpretation by exploring the immersive technologies to enhance user experience, uh, both in person and online. So we are exploring towards uh, uh, the cross-platform uh, user interactions through virtual reality, augmented reality, and the 3D interactions, uh, and to see what are the best ways to engage with the public audience uh, when they were uh, engaging with the museums, either online or at home. So the objectives are to create the 3D uh, the, um, costume uh, digitizations and will research and test the process involved and develop efficient workflows based on the explorations. And particularly for the small and the medium business, so we aren't aiming or targeting towards um, so the expensive solutions, but trying to say so if um, there is uh, um, so the um, much lower budget for the uh, so the uh, free or open uh, resource solutions uh, can be used uh, to uh, help with uh, uh, the digitization process, uh, such as uh, 3D scanning, uh, photogrammetries, uh, and also all these type of technologies uh, to bring uh, the physical uh, garments or, or the physical um, uh, display or the collections into a digital uh, context. And we are also... <coughs> to explore a mixture of virtual and physical experience on location and online to tell the stories of the costume in order to engage visitors and wider audiences, and in turn to aid the resilience of rural museums in the post-COVID recovery. And we're also trying to develop the experience using the augmented reality and the extended reality applications and explore the opportunities to make the 3D models available to the commercial market, so such as the gaming and the fashion industries. Um, so you might heard about a concept so it's called Metaverse. So Metaverse previously is only uh, related to sort of Facebook, so this type of the VR game, uh, gaming experience. But there is also a new uh, interpretations towards the Metaverse concept. So it's now talking about uh, so everything related in the immersive technologies. So uh, not only in the virtual reality, augmented reality, and extended realities, but also talks about uh, the challenges related in the artificial intelligence, uh, 5G and blockchain, and all these technologies getting together into the technology, uh, into the uh, immersive uh, technologies. And this is a global trend of also bringing so our physical lives into a digital world. And not only in so the UK have um, so a lot of investment into this area, but also I've also just got uh, so the Chinese uh, government document and calling for the um, ideas and the concept to bring the virtual interactions to the museums, the galleries, and uh, all the um, so the tourists, so the virtual tourism so related topics. There is a huge demand and also the huge interest into the digitization process and particularly bring into the future virtual world. And um, so that is uh, so basically what we do for the interface virtual. I will hand back to Karen. Thank you, Yang. Um... So um, just bringing the presentation to a close, we just wanted to highlight that we are a truly interdisciplinary project and we're always happy to share our tech wherever we can. Um, we managed to get some additional funding from the university. Um, so we have toys to play with. Um, we have a variety of LiDAR scanning devices, um, mobile phones, iPads. We have several different types of VR headset. We have motion capture suits. We've just got ourselves some interactive projectors, which we're about to start exploring and, and playing around with. And we also have access to various software programs. Um, 
So really, it's to say, you know, if you think any of this is of interest to you, please do get in touch with us and we can perhaps explore what interests you and, and how that could be developed into something that might be interesting or useful to you and your business. In summary, then, our research has a focus on inspiring digital futures for industry partners, for researchers, for organisations, and of course, for our students. We, we hope that today's presentation highlights how an initial project can grow and develop in different ways. You can see on the diagram here, we've branched out into some funded PhD studentships, um, all of our associated projects. We really see ourselves as, as impacting on the digital economy, on knowledge exchange, um, and, and kind of looking at how we can add value in that digital space um, with, a, with a focus on Scotland's small businesses. Um, our key themes are digital, sustainability, and interdisciplinarity. That's what's at our core. And I guess what we've really found is that, that we can learn lots from one another. Um, Yang, Josie, and I, we all come from different disciplines. We've, we've spent a lot of time working together and a lot of time learning one another's communication styles and tools of work and, and all sorts of things that we just didn't know because we come from dif different disciplines. And, and the whole move into digital really does require that level of interdisciplinarity to and, and understanding one another to get workable solutions. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Um, we really appreciate your time and we would encourage you to get in touch with any of us if you would like to go into more detail about our work or, of course, to discuss any future projects. Um, so I am going to stop sharing now and hand over to Caroline Adams from Interface. Just before Caroline Adams comes on, if it's okay if I could just interject a second. Um, thank you very much. That's been an amazing amount of information and also to get insight into the work that you've all been doing. And as you say, the sort of bringing it all together across different departments, um, making it very usable, etc. Just a couple of quick questions, if that's okay, um, Karen. On the, um, uh, actually it was Josie, sorry, the, the Shetland workshop, um, what sort of technology will be there that people would then get to see if I can just ask those questions at this point? You're on mute, Josie. Josie. <laughs> yeah, um, probably best to, Yang will tell you a bit more. We will have um, a range of um, different immersive um, demonstrations and opportunities um, for um, anybody who wants to come along to to try sort of um, some of the headsets, the Oculus um, headsets. Um, I think I'll hand over to Yang, if that's OK, just to give you a bit more of a rundown on the technology side of things. Thank you. <laughs> yes, happy for that. Um, so we're thinking about uh, to bring different kinds of virtual reality headsets, such as uh, so the Oculus uh, um, Quest 1, Quest 2, and then so the um, uh, Pico uh, Pico 4, so the VR headset, and also we bring so the mixed reality, so the Microsoft HoloLens 2, and we're also thinking about uh, so the project mapping, uh, so the projector, so it's called a light form, and we also have some other uh, interactive um, sensors, uh, such as Z sensor and the Kinect, etc. So it will be great fun, and please do join us, uh, so if you are close by. <laughs> Great, thank you. Well, I don't want to hold Carol Ann up um, any further at this point. We will come back and do questions. So for anyone in the audience, if you want to drop some questions into the Q&A, uh, we'll have time at the end to do that. Um, I guess, which uh, leading on to Carol Ann now, obviously it's the connectivity between what industry and what people need in this region against what the university can offer. So um, I am going to now hand over to Carol Ann, who will talk about the role that Interface have played in that knowledge transfer. Thank you. Thanks, Joan. Um, hi, um, as Joan says, I'm Carol Ann and I work for Interface in the Highlands and Islands team. So where do we fit into all of this? Uh, next slide, please, Claire. 
So as Karen, Josie and Jang have all been describing, there's so much research expertise across the university network, which can be valuable and very useful to small businesses. But how do you actually tap into that knowledge? But even if you knew of a contact in your local university, you may need assistance from a different department. And the Scottish University Network is a big beastie. So how do you know who to contact and, and how to get hold of them? So that's where Interface can help. Next slide, please, Claire. So Interface, it's part of the Scottish Business Support landscape, and it bridges that gap by providing a matchmaking service which is free of charge and a completely impartial. And we help to match businesses with the best academic teams across Scotland to deliver projects which will help solve a challenge or an issue the business is facing, but they don't have the knowledge or capability in-house. And we work with any size of business in any sector. And we also work with many third sector organisations and charities too. And it doesn't matter where they're located. We help rural businesses as much as we do urban businesses, because quite often rural businesses don't have the same connections on their doorstep as many um, city centre businesses have. Next slide, please. So we work with a wide range of university partners, um, including an awful lot of colleges and all of the innovation centres as well. So if a business has an idea that they'd like to explore, are developing new products, improving existing services, or looking to find brand new ways of working to help grow the business, then we can help find an academic partner for them. And we're on hand from start to finish. So we make the process of engaging with an academic team as straightforward as possible. We don't just introduce it to an academic and then waltz off into the sunset. We're, we're there throughout the whole process. Next slide, please. So a project doesn't need to be about digital technologies either. A university can help with any number of areas, um, exploring new target markets, feasibility studies, branding, improvements to internal working processes, digital marketing, social media, engineering, waste management, to name but a few. Um, the, the, the amount and the, the scope of the different projects that we get involved in is, is fantastically huge. Um, means it's such a, an interesting job as well. Next slide, please. So if there's costs associated with the project, um, we can help identify funding too. There's small innovation grants available, and that's up to £5,000, which goes directly to the university for their work on the project. And you need only match that with an in-kind contribution, not cash. So that could be the business's time, materials or equipment. And then you can move on. It's, it's considered a bit of a cycle. There's a student placement innovation voucher. That's also up to £5,000 for a, a PhD or master's student to work and continue the work on the innovation voucher project. There's also advanced innovation vouchers and they're up to £20,000 on a sliding scale of the required cash contribution from the business, depending on the value of the project. And that's equally as valuable. And then there's also um, larger scale, longer term projects such as the KTP, which Josie ran through, and we can help source a suitable academic partner for you if you don't have one identified already. Um, there's also many, many opportunities for students to work on defined projects, um, which don't normally incur a cost for the business at all. So the business benefits from fresh thinking and up-to-date research, sometimes from a group of students, not just an individual, <coughs> excuse me. And the students also benefit from working on real-world challenges, which will increase their skill set and ultimately their employability. And we often find that once a business academic collaboration is formed, further funding opportunities can open up as some schemes actually ask that you've got a, a business has an academic partner in place before you go ahead and apply. Last slide, please, Claire. So I hope that might spark some ideas for a project, but um, I would be absolutely delighted to go through any of this in more detail with anyone if they wanted to get in touch, either from an academic department trying to reach businesses or from a business trying to reach an academic partner because we work in both ways. Um, that's just a, a little bit of a whistle stop tour of the interface service.
Great. Thank you, Caroline. That was really useful to get that overview. Some people may be aware of the work that Interface do, but effectively they're connecting the need of the industry or the, 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 the company um, to ideally finding the right academic partner to be able to support that. So um, certainly worth talking to them. There's also other support um, for projects out there um, funding around Innovate UK for anyone um, who's also interested in innovation and development. Obviously, it is the drive for the future. And, and great, we're talking about innovation and, and particularly that digital advancement within this, this region as well today. Um, we've got a couple of questions. I'm just going to read them out. Um, so this one's, you mentioned working with Kirsten Stewart and someone else, small businesses. Will the research and results of what the outcomes were be available afterwards? I think this is for Karen, is it? Yes, absolutely. Um, so we will be developing our project website. It's a little minimal at the moment, but we're getting there with it. And one of the parts of that website will be a toolkit. Um, so perhaps where we'll we'll share what free resources we've experimented with and how we found them in terms of ease of use and usability and, and output. Um, we will also publish papers as well, but I know that's not always as accessible to all as, as just something more useful. So short reports and and toolkits will be available on the website at the project close, which the, the project runs for another year. Um, we're working at the moment towards a final digital fashion event. Um, and then we'll need to gather user experience and feedback on how that went as well. Um, so all of that will end up on augmentedfashion.co.uk. Okay, thank you. And then the other question is, is there a way to keep in touch with projects coming up that we could take part in? I guess it's, um, yeah, how, how do, how do uh, people outside the university get access to what is happening in this, in this area? I think one of the ways is if, if um, jo joining the Immersive Scotland um, membership, um, it's just really an email. If we have your email address, we can share any opportunities um, through that. Um, and it doesn't necessarily just relate to our own Immersive Scotland events, but much wider. If we're running events through augmented fashion, we would also um, advertise those um, through through there um, and, and also through the university as well. So um there, there'll be a number of different but different ways of, of accessing information but one of the ways would be through immersive scotland definitely excellent um has anybody else got any questions in the audience um, in the meantime i'm just going to ask a couple that um uh, i'm interested in too so how did the project come about because obviously um you've harris tweed involved you've got your own research work how did you connect people? Uh, where did, did it begin? Well, I'll, I'll just, oh, sorry, Karen, you go. <laughs> oh, I was just to say, um, it was kind of our research office who Yang had already been working out in China and had this idea for a project. And it's a good example of interdisciplinarity. Yang had the computing side, but not the fashion side. And our research office got us together. They, they sort of said, Karen, Josie, can you come and speak to Yang over a cup of coffee? Um, and it grew from there. Um, yeah, I don't know if you, if you want to add to that, Josie. From yeah, I was just going to say we we started, um, I suppose, quite small in the sense that we we had our first six months, which was back in 2019. Um, we got a small small grant, relatively small grant, from the Arts and Humanities Research Council, really as just to scope out the whole. The whole point was to scope out potential partners, um, both in the UK and in in china so that six month project was was really instrumental i think in in both helping us to form partnerships so we we went to china twice to um work with our um academic partner at donghua university and to meet um, a number of different people from different organizations and businesses um particularly around the shanghai area and get a sense of the opportunities that there were in China. And then in Scott, well, in the UK, we decided to really focus on the highlands and islands. So we had um, 
we ha- already had a, a, um, a relationship with Harris Tweed Hebrides, um, with with Karen's um, course on the fashion management. So we we um, approached them to see if they would be interested, which luckily they were. And then um, we went on a number of trips um, up to the Highlands and Islands and met with other um, potential creative creative business people who would be interested so that's when we connected for example with Christine Stewart and also with um, Neela in in, um, in Shetland um, so yeah that six months was really instrumental and really from from the success of that networking scoping um, we were then able to put in a larger funding application which Yang um, led on um, to to develop a, a longer project with our partners. I think, I think that's a good example, though, of how getting involved with universities in different ways. So Harris Street Hebrides what, um, had someone who was an external examiner on our fashion management course. Um, and then that's grown into other things. And, and we're always looking for industry input, whether that's through live client projects, whether it's through student placements even just being a part of our industry liaison groups, which most schools within the university have, something like that, the commitment is quite low. Um, It's maybe meeting us once or twice a year and just giving your views about what your industry is doing and what sort of things we should be teaching on our courses. But then it does provide that knowledge and networking experience that then maybe can lead on to other things. Um, So if there's anything like that that anybody thinks they're interested in, do just drop us a line. Our contact details were on the final slide um, and we can add you to these these various lists or opportunities. Excellent. Thank you. There's one more question come in. Um, How much of a difference to the project of working with Chinese partners and looking at China as a market make? Um, you think the project and the results would have looked a different from a different international partner? Yes, I, I think this looks like a question to me. <laughs> and that's also uh, answers. So uh, quite a lot of different aspects. So uh, from the Chinese context and uh, so the UK context and also worldwide. Um, there is a huge difference, actually. So for uh, doing a project in the UK and uh, uh, looking into so the ways of collaborations with uh, Chinese partners, and uh, because of the cultural differences and also so the living style differences, uh, so the communications uh, um, on two ways are completely different. So a typical example is, uh, for example, we can, I mean, seamlessly uh, meet each other virtually like today. But in China, so if you're trying to communicate with Chinese partners, uh, virtual communications is always not the best way. And uh, even after the COVID, uh, so the Chinese uh, remains uh, so interested into so chatting in person and build up uh, so the trust, mutual trust, so in this kind of physical uh, contact. But there is also quite a lot of shared interest, uh, which also explains so the importance and the significance of our project. So which is, I mean, the focus of so looking into the immersive technologies and looking into all these digital uh, technology needs uh, from both markets. So not only in the UK, but also China has uh, big demands so towards uh, 3D and the digital um, uh, technologies and also so the sustainability in the fashion and textile and all these kind of things. So we share so the same agenda um, towards uh, um, so the research interest. And for the Chinese government, so both the central government and also the local government, for example, like Shanghai government or the other city governments, so they all have uh, so these kind of uh, project opportunities that they are exploring uh, for the uh, partnerships uh, internationally. And uh, I think uh, so that is another thing we were we were trying to achieve through the project. Uh, so that's the reason why we start discussing about the cross platform immersive technologies other than just the VR and the AR and all these type of things. So the thing is uh, there is a huge and increase uh, so the interest uh, so worldwide, including like America or I mean the Australia, so all these countries, uh, they have this interest into so metaverse. So as I just explained, uh, so this concept has been widening um so beyond uh, so the commercial concept. Uh, so there is also the increased interest uh, from the international partners. So we can definitely see so we might be able to so create uh, um so the other international partners from other countries or the other parts of the world. Thank you. 
Excellent. Thank you. Um, we're, we've got another five minutes or so before we come to the end. And there's an interesting question here um, related to the augmented fashion consumer research. Interesting that the brand perceptions change so radically when you use new technologies to portray the house tweed brand. However, it did seem to move away from the handmade and words related to provenance towards modern trendy, i.e. more than uh, more about presentation than about the backstory. Is this about playing a long game, accepting that young consumers are more price sensitive, which works against Scottish brands, but instilling interest over time, or can shopping habits be changed more quickly? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. We were surprised at the, the huge swing, you know, that these participants um, had in their perceptions just in the space of five minutes of watching two short pieces of content. I think we learned some lessons. As I said there, I think our our world was a bit too crazy, um, which is why the new stuff that we're developing with Lateral North will have much more about heritage and backstory incorporated into it. Um, and we'll do the same survey again to see how that fares. Um, but I think, yeah, there is an element of the long game there in terms of bringing those brands to the attention of a younger consumer because it, they're quite easy they're quite easily overlooked um so you know i feel it's important for us working in a scottish university to highlight these things to our students but also to find ways of of highlighting it more to the general public one of the things we found out when we went out to china for example was that the Chinese population know very little about Scotland, very little about Scottish brands. For them, it's it's UK brands and UK is London. Um, so if immersive tech is a way to, to bringing those brands more to the fore in an international market, I think, you know, that's a worthwhile enterprise. And, yeah, the move away from handmade towards modern and trendy that you've highlighted there, Kirsty. maybe we needed to refine our content and, and really kind of re-emphasize the handmade nature. But also I think it's for brands to decide how they want to be perceived. And if, if a brand like Harris Tweed Hebrides is perceived as very traditional and for an older consumer, they're not going to get that interest from younger people. But actually, you know, they are making for... Vivian Westwood and Louis Vuitton and Max Mara and all of these quite desirable brands. So actually seeing them as more modern or more fashion forward may well be a good thing. We There, there were advantages and there were drawbacks. The drawbacks that it was perhaps seen as not so expensive and not so luxury but there were definite advantages in terms of appealing to a younger audience, a more tech-savvy audience, and perhaps an audience that is at a stage of life that is more fashion-focused. Um, and it may be that that some of our traditional and heritage brands need a little bit of that to acquire these new customers, even if that customer may not purchase for a while. That's a really good point, sir. And I think a lot of this is around the education of the making of the product and this is where immersive um, technologies and digital communication can come into that because I think when consumers recognize how long a product takes to make, it's not instant and the skill base that is used, they're often more interested to invest and be a part of that once they've experienced that. And that's obviously easy to do if, for example, you're in a mill or a studio workshop where you can see the hands on the product. But actually, if you're trying to engage with a, 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 a consumer who's um, in a different part of the world, um, video and uh, various um, th these new forms of immersive um, technology can help bring that person inside that that mill space or that studio so that they can get the feeling of being a part of that and really understand that journey. But that is that is the long, longer distance um, journey to, to take on. So we're just coming towards the end of our hour. I don't know if anybody else has any other comments to make. Um, I hope you find this really interesting. I certainly have. It's great to see the work that the team at Robert Gordon University are doing and, and how it's being connected across different departments and on different technologies as well. Um, so yeah, really, really interesting session today. Thank you very much to Josie, to Karen, to Yang and to Caroline as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.
And uh, just one last thing, I believe that this session has been recorded and will be available for those that have been attending today to see it and uh, potentially will be up on the Expo North digital website to watch again because there's a lot of information to take in there. So anyway, thank you very much to everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.